Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm Nick. Uh, I'm in charge of uh, the API documentation and developer experience at WorldPay. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've gone about documenting a new suite of hypermedia driven APIs. I did a very brief cameo on my colleague's presentation at the last API docs in Paris. Um, wasn't quite prepared with the slides, so it was a little bit confusing. So I'm hoping to kind of build on that a little bit here. Um, I also found out yesterday whilst we were at DevRelCon that not that many people are aware of WorldPay. Um, we are one of the largest global payments providers, um, but yeah, we're not Stripe, so <laughs> that's probably why no one knows. <laughs> cool. So I'm going to start off by giving uh, a brief kind of introduction to hypermedia-driven APIs and Hatios. Um, just with a show of hands, how many people here have kind of worked with hypermedia or Hatios and are familiar with it? Oh. <laughs> at least know about it, yeah, cool. That will hopefully mean I can, uh, I can go through a little bit quicker with uh, the description. Um, I'll then go on to talk about um, why at WorldPay we decided to go with a hypermedia-driven suite of APIs and then try and dig into a bit more of the documentation and some of the assets that we've produced. And then lastly, we're still quite early days with what we're doing with this, so um, I'll try and take a look at kind of where we want to go next with it. I also don't want this to be a debate about kind of API design. Um, some really great stuff on GraphQL, so there may be a few kind of crossovers. Um, I think there's some some principles that are, are quite similar across the two, across the two. So Triple H, not the wrestler. Mm -hmm. um, so hypermedia itself um, is, as I've seen, quite prevalent within kind of standard REST APIs. Uh, it generally refers to anything that isn't simply hypertext. So it could actually be images, it could be video, it could be graphics. Um, but in this context and within our APIs, we'll generally talk about it in terms of hyperlinks. Uh, Hatios or Hypermedia as the engine of application state, which is the longest, hardest acronym. <laughs> um, not a fan of that one. But um, the idea behind this is it's a bit of a, an, an architecture. It's, it's designed to allow the consumer to manage state using these hypermedia hyperlinks, uh, which get returned in the response. So I'll talk a little bit more about how this kind of works uh, in my next slide. Um, and finally, HAL. Uh, HAL is hypertext application language, and it's generally uh, a convention used within hypermedia to kind of try and standardize a lot of the, the responses that come back and help the client to kind of be aware and, and help them to consume the hyperlinks in the same way every time. So how is it different? Here's a couple of uh, a couple of diagrams. Uh, this is going to be a very very simple view. Obviously, there's lots of kind of nuances with with both, um, which aren't really covered by these very simple diagrams. Um, but essentially, the point I'm trying to get with REST is that it's much more of that kind of uh, flatter a flatter line of resources. Um, so you can essentially make a request to any of those resources at any time because providing you've got good documentation, um, you should know all of the URLs up front or at least be able to make a guess. And making a guess is never a good thing. Um, <laughs> so the, the idea as well with, with more traditional uh, REST APIs is that they're, they're stateless, so you, there's no way of kind of managing the state more. Uh, it, it's a lot harder to manage the state with a kind of more traditional REST API. So looking at the right-hand side with a, a kind of hypermedia-driven API, the, the state then becomes managed by the links. So 
the the kind of twigs of the tree. I'm I'm going to go into the the tree uh, analogy as well because um, I think it it does work quite well for hypermedia as well as GraphQL. But um, the, the the twigs that you see on the kind of right hand side, um, the URLs for these resources aren't known up front. So mm -hmm. these are all uh, generated dynamically by previous requests. So the ones furthest right, in order to access those resources, you would have to query the root resource first. You'd then make a subsequent request and get a link back, and then get another link and follow that. So with this, we prefer to think of these resources, these URLs, more as actions rather than URLs. So each of those represents something, an action that you want to perform. It's not just hitting a resource. Um, <coughs> my my title originally for this talk was that uh, all resources are equal, but some are more equal than others. So this was kind of trying to demonstrate that with REST, it's generally they're all kind of equal, but with Hatios hypermedia driven, they're generally a bit more equal than others. So. Why did we choose a hypermedia API? For us, we had noticed that with more standard REST APIs that people were hitting some issues with making invalid requests. And this was potentially causing us issues downstream. Um, payments obviously is quite a, an important part of, of well, the internet and, and of everything. So. If people are making bad requests with payments, it's, it's generally not a good thing. Um, so taking a kind of payments example, this is very simple, distilled down version, but you'd start off by uh, authorizing a payment. That essentially reserves the funds in an account, and that kind of starts the process of paying for something. The next step would be to settle or capture those funds, so actually take those funds and, and move them to the merchant's account. And let's say something went wrong or the person didn't like the product, you might then have to, to process a refund. For us, we don't want to let anyone even attempt to refund anything before they've even done the authorization and settled the funds. So we just don't give the refund URL out. It's, it's generated dynamically because the only time we want people to perform that refund request is when there's a, a, some funds to, to refund. So that was kind of the driver behind this, uh, the whole kind of payments lifecycle piece. Um, and yeah, and once that payment is done, it's, it's, it's gone, you then start that process all over again. Um, the other piece, which is kind of tied in a little bit with the, the GraphQL and some of the other the talks that people have done, is this notion of discoverability, the idea that you can kind of navigate your way through the documentation, through the API, just by following the links. And we think with the kind of payments within the payment space and, and the payments kind of use case, that, that works quite well. So, why not open API? <laughs> I am actually a big fan of open API and uh, have done some work with it in the past. And I actually joined WellPay after a lot of these decisions were made. So my first question within my first week was, why are we not using open API? <laughs> and I was met with lots of people telling me that we've decided to go down the route of this HATIOS hypermedia driven API design and the current specification doesn't really support it well enough for us to, to kind of pursue it. So I don't know, I think me being selfish, I kind of wanted open API first, then API design second, but they were much much keener on the design that they'd gone with. And for the reasons I just explained, it, it does make sense. Um, so 
we just create our own spec. Um, <laughs> as you do, I mean, um, yeah, we, we figured that the only way that we could get around the issue was to just try and do something ourselves. Um, so yes, we are kind of very early days with, with what we're doing, um, but we kind of think that there's some value um, and we're gonna pursue it, um, me with clenched teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so, the documentation. Um, as I mentioned, we created our own set of specification files. Um, these are all hosted alongside the, the API um, across all of our environments as well. So uh, you can basically see the, the, the documentation and it will be relevant with the relevant uh, root URLs across all of our environments. Um, we also have then used those specifications to generate our reference <coughs> documentation within our developer portal. And as mentioned uh, before, having a, a guide, having some supporting documentation for these kinds of APIs is genuinely very handy. Um, you know, it, it can't all be driven by those specification files and by the reference documentation. So I apologize for just dumping a bit of JSON on the screen. Uh, <laughs> This is the, what we call the resource tree. So I said I was gonna mention trees. Uh, this resource tree exists for every single one of our APIs and it maps out how each of the resources fit within that tree. Uh, so you can see where refund sits there. That is not something that you can hit until you've done the previous requests. Uh, it also links to all of the other specification files. So for each resource, we have a JSON file which describes everything that that uh, resource can do. It has all the information around the HTTP methods, the request schema, response schema, authorization, headers, everything that you'd expect to see in an open API specification, but we do this per resource this also gives us a bit more space to add in examples. So we have lots of example requests and responses, happy path, sad path. It's all there so that when you're looking through this, you can see what you'd expect to get back if you were um, performing multiple scenarios. This, this kind of stuff is not great to view <laughs> through the browser. So we've put it into our API reference. We've built in the kind of the tree as our table of contents on the left hand side. So within our developer portal, we can specify each of these resource trees. And from there, they will go off, hit the, the JSON files that are stored with the service and populate all of the documentation that you can see within the reference. Um, one of the important things with this notion of hypermedia links is that we show people what their next actions are, what, their, what the links to their next actions are. So we have this notion of link relationships um, listing out all of the action links. So this allows the user to click through the documentation as they would by making the requests. Um, so you can start off by making an authorization and then you can click on the link relationship for that settle and from that settle you can click on the link relationship for the refund and it'll tell you all of the documentation, all of the kind of schemas, all the available uh, methods that you can make against those. And then on the right hand side we have all of these examples that I mentioned previously. So uh, where we have the little red buttons, if you click them it'll populate the right hand side uh, with example requests and responses for that specific scenario. And then we have the user guide. So this is very much focused around the concepts and the use cases and kind of education. We, we, we realize that 
it's very important for developers to integrate this in the right way. So we need to educate our developers around how to do this integration. We don't want them to start hard coding URLs that they found by querying the API. These URLs might change. So they need to be aware that they have to follow the links through the path. If they don't do that, then if we start making changes to the API, then this could break their integration. So it's really important. And we've got lots of work to do around kind of self-certification and basic checklists, at least, to kind of ensure that people are integrating this in the right way. This product is very much early days, so there's lots and lots of work to do to flesh this guide out. Uh, this is probably the main area that we need to work on. Um, we want to get tutorials, we want to get more examples in there, we want to get lots more code snippets. Um, but yeah, we, we did get a little bit distracted by our, our JSON and our, on our API reference, so we, we really need to, to pick this up and actually, actually do some work on it. So taking this a little bit further, because we create our own specification, we create our own resource trees, this gave us the thought that, well, you know, with an open API spec, you can generate all sorts of things. Why not take our own specification and start generating some other bits and pieces? So this is a, just a little gift that demonstrates one of the kind of interactive assets that we have within our documentation. So this goes with that education piece where we're saying, you know, this is the tree. You need to query the root resource in order to get your your links. Uh, it shows the HTTP methods to achieve each of the scenarios on the left-hand side. And we've tried to bake in a little bit of the business context. You know, why are you performing this request at this time? Why this action? Um, why not one of the other links that you've got back from the previous request? So where do we go from here? As I mentioned, we want to kind of build out our user guide. And as part of that, we want to kind of bring in some more of these interactive assets. And with the principle that we've used before, we want to ensure that these are all generated from the JSON files that we've produced. Um, we've done a lot of work with these JSON files. We're, we're using them to design new APIs. We're very much down that kind of spec-driven uh, spec API design. So they're important to us, we need to make best use of them. Um, so yeah, we're hoping to have some more kind of interactive assets to help users follow through the various journeys and follow the links and the actions that they get back from their requests. We also are close to implementing sandbox playground functionality within our API reference, all of which will still be generated from the JSON files, the specification files, um, this is something that, you know, it's, it's a key part and we need to allow people to, to have a play around with, with these APIs. That they're, they're very interactive, they're very much action driven, so if, if, you, can't, if you can't do it and you can't see it for yourself, then, then they're, they're not as valuable. And then the big kind of speculative piece at the end, um, I would like to develop this a lot further uh, and potentially look to start uh, open sourcing this in the future. Um, we're a long, long, long way off doing that. Um, but if we can get it right and if we can see the value in what we've done, then it would be really good to sort of give something back and actually provide this as an option for people that want to go down a, a hypermedia, hatios driven route. So just to, to recap, Hatios isn't for everyone. Um, it's For me, I feel it's very much something that suits our use case, and I think if you were going to go down that route, you would probably want to to make sure it, it also suited your use case. Hive Media itself, you know, it's fine to start including that, I would say, in, in APIs. There's lots of value in, in Hive Media. Um, I'm not saying don't use that, but I think if you're going to really pile into ATOS, then I, I'd make sure it really fits with the, the use case that you're going for. Um, this notion of discoverability, 
Um, I guess self-documentation kind of comes into that. It, it does help ease the pain and the barrier of entry for integrators. It does allow, if you can let people kind of click through your API and, and see it, uh, it, it does help ease the pain. Uh, education for us is very much key. We know we don't want people to be integrating in the wrong way. Yeah, if you're a little crazy, create your own spec. Uh, I do still think we're pretty crazy for doing that because <laughs> <laughs> with all the tools and everything, the ecosystems that are around, um, we may have shot ourselves in the foot a little bit, but you know, I think there is definitely some value in, in what we've done so far. And yeah, the main thing for me to get across, and I think what we need our docs to get across is this notion that it's all about actions and it's about the trees. And we just don't want people to start ho hard coding their URLs because the state is all managed through the API and, and they need to be aware that all these links are generated dynamically. <coughs> I appreciate that was a very quick whistle stop tour through <laughs> media. Um, so I think I may have left myself some time for questions. If anyone has any, if not, if it's a bit more detailed, then I'm happy to, to speak to people afterwards. Go for it. Uh, I'm interested in your ideas because it seems like a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're telling me. <laughs> I, at the moment, we're going to pursue it. Um, at the moment, OAS 3.0 doesn't really get there. Uh, there's a slight move towards it. There is a little bit of support for hypermedia, but there is not full Hatios support in any way. It's it's very much aimed at static URLs. So any any URLs that are then dynamically generated. It's very hard to represent that in the current specification. Um, we're hoping that what we've done is at least a step towards something a little bit better for that architecture. Um, one of the other options would potentially have been to take the existing OAS spec and extend it based what we've done off that. Um, that may be something that we flip back to in the long run. Uh, I think I'd be keen to have a look at that and see if we can at least align ourselves to a degree to something that's a bit more of a standard. But given that we can't really make use of the, the tooling, uh, any of the kind of auto-generated documentation or you know client libraries, any of that stuff, even if we did sort of mash it into OAS, we, would, we still wouldn't be able to get that. So for now, yeah, with, with gritted teeth, we're gonna, we're gonna plow on. <laughs> Sorry, up there for now. Yeah. Well, final question. First of all, there are five international standards for payments for using URL that run. So you, you could just split between a few concessions. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, my, my question really is about performance because you looked at this and thought it was a bit kind of for high volume, high performance systems or high throughput systems. Um, we, I, we shied away to a certain extent because of that. Yeah. So it is quite chatty. That's just the nature of it. Um, we, we're we still establishing some kind of standards around uh, caching, for instance. So when you query the root resource to get your links back, you know how long do you store and cache those links for? Um, so that's part of it. We've, d we've invested a lot in the infrastructure and, and supporting these APIs. So at the moment, it, it's not something that we're really seeing an issue with. Um, as we grow and extend, who knows? But f at the moment, you know, we've done a lot of work to, to ensure that it's not an issue for us. Anyone else? Go for it. How are people finding you? It's, so we still only have a handful of pilot customers. Um, mm. And we found that we are having to educate them quite considerably into the notion of not just throwing all the URLs in there and, you know, I need to make a request against this resource, so I just make a request against that resource. Is there much pressure on the integration? To a degree. It, 
we're we're trying to you know we're trying to push this so we need to make sure that that's not an issue um so for us like the documentation is, is absolutely essential going forward it's it's kind of it becomes make or break at times so things like the the tree diagram that i showed and things like that are really important to us and that's what we're trying to put a lot of uh, time and effort into to do just to try and convince people that there is another another way um i guess maybe similar to graphql in terms of it is it's a, a very different way of thinking about things but then soap to rest was probably a similar thing you know it, it, it has to start somewhere so um once we have a, a larger kind of base of users to to go from then we'll probably be able to get a more valuable um, look SDKs. and and then and sdks yeah so that's kind of the next step where once we mature a little bit more um and we stop being quite so rapid in our our development then we'll take a step back and and just throw a load of code in there and get people up and running a bit quicker go for it so so if you need a big a request can you go out on the internet and find all the the sites where people are deba debating whether hkos is any use or not and and put in a comment saying well we found a, a genuine use case where it, it's useful for us because everywhere you go there's like there's quite a lot of purism and, and, yep. and philosophical thou shalt do hkos because rest says you must do hkos so, <laughs> yeah so we've got architects at our place scratching their heads building really really chatty apis but yours is nice because it's like the actions happen in time one after the other whereas ours is chatty i've got to call all of these damn things before i can even display yeah. pull together the data i need realistically um, a lot of these requests would be made over a period of potentially yeah, days yeah, yeah yeah exactly and that that's that's really nice so i, I go to every single um, place where it's been discussed. <laughs> <laughs> it work, this, this is, this Mic is drop. a good idea, <laughs> and it's working for us, but our view is it doesn't work everywhere. Yeah. It help the world at large stop trying everyone to do ATOS. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it just it does simply not. doesn't work for everyone. You know, yeah. for more CRUD-based things, it's definitely not, yeah. not an option. So. Questions? Yes. Questions. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thanks for listening, everyone.